Welcome back, everybody. I am Brian Lee Durfee, author of The Forgetting Moon and The Blackest Heart, both published by Simon & Schuster's Saga Press. Today, I'm going to be reviewing The Sword of the Lictor by Gene Wolfe, book number three in Gene Wolfe's amazing Book of the New Sun series. I reviewed book one here. I reviewed book two. Now we're to book three. I will soon be reviewing book four and book five coming up. You know, I used to have the series in these omnibus editions, which are cool. I still have them. I'll keep them around. They're cool. But now I've got the series in the original hardcovers, which is awesome. We always review the covers. That's another cover by Don Mates. He's the one that he's the guy that painted all the covers for the series. I think it's good. We've got our uh, main man, the torturer here, with his sword terminus est. My favorite name for a sword in the history of fantasy. I've become obsessed with this series lately. You know, I read these things a long, long time ago and didn't quite appreciate them for what they were back in the day when I was reading them. I've just been rereading them and I have been devouring them. I have been like drinking in every single word of this Book of the New Sun series. Now we're to book three, folks. I can't even begin to describe to you what these books are even about. If you saw my reviews of these other two, you know these books are bananas. The main story is we've got our torturer. He's an apprentice torturer. He gets kicked out of the torturer's guild because he takes has mercy on a person he's supposed to torture and kill. So they boot him out of the torturer's guild, and then he goes off onto his adventures all of his own. He's like, he takes his sword, Terminus Est, and his dark cloak, and his torturer mask, and he is just off on the road. And that's what happens. I mean, this is kind of like uh, told from the first person. The character's name is Severian. Everything is told through the, his eyes, his perspective, much like... I compare this a lot to The Name of the Wind. People who love The Name of the Wind will love this also because it's just darker and the writing is just so just... I can't describe how odd the writing in the story is, but it reminds me a lot of the way The, Norm of, the Name of the Wind is constructed in its prose and in just a story in general where it's... The plot, there is a plot that's kind of forming through the three books, but it's not plot heavy, if you know what I'm talking about. The Name of the Wind isn't necessarily all that plot heavy. And that's kind of what we're getting here. We're just kind of getting Severian's life as an outcast torturer as he goes through and one thing after the next happens to him. This book, we start out in a prison. Our torturers now become a prison guard, of all things. Right up my alley, you know if you've been following my reviews that I have worked in the Utah State Prison for 13 years. I've been a prison guard. I do those kind of things. I know. So very, very great descriptions of the prison. Right off the bat, I loved reading about this prison in this world. And then so our, our main guy, Severian, you know, he, he's got the claw of the um, conciliator. It's much like this. It's much like a crystal ball. You know, it's, it's like a crystal ball, you know, and he's always got it, and he's really obsessed with it. He protects it. He protects it. He's got an OCD, like, protection of this ball. Like, he, it has to be with him everywhere. He's even made a special leather pouch for it. Like, he's checking it constantly, you know. And, and I get that because, you know, in, in my job in law enforcement, once in a while they send me out, and I have to wear a pistol on my hip. And I know what it's like when you're in public and you got a pistol on your hip. You're just always checking to make sure that it's there, that somebody hasn't snatched it. I mean, you're just paranoid that you've got this dangerous weapon with you all the time. And my gosh, somebody might take it. Somebody might try to wrestle it from me. Well, that's the feeling we get with Severian and the claw of the conciliator, which is the crystal ball, magic crystal ball thing. It's got healing powers. He knows it's got a lot of powers. It's, in fact, it's healing powers. One of the plot threads, one of the themes I'm starting to get from this series is Severian is a very sort of almost 
Christ-like figure. And there's almost like this second coming of Christ sort of building up in the plot where is Severian going to be the new son? You know, is he going to be like the second coming of this sort of savior? Well, now he's got this claw of the conciliator that he's so protective of. I mean, to an OCD type degree. And he's just always got it. But it's got healing powers, right? And it heals. And he's very... That's where it starts to get really Christ-like, where the guy is like, he's a torturer, he's a kind of a bad guy, but yet he's got the power to heal people and bring them, even bring them back from the dead. And he's got this girl, Dorcas. I know that's a weird name for a girl, but it's kind of this girl that's been following through the adventures. And she's still there. She's um still his companion uh, throughout the first part of the book, you know, then we get man-eating monsters. There's a scene with man-eating monsters, and I'm just like, oh my gosh. You know, a lot of the book is kind of slow. You're, you're reading the book just for the beautiful prose and the themes and the elegant story that's being told. And then all of a sudden, Gene Wolfe just drops just like blood-dripping violence on top of you. Just, And there's a scene with man-eating monster just... I mean, literally like that. I mean, it's just like... You know, and then, then there's a scene where Severian do adopts a son. He adopts a son, and, and he just calls him Severian, little Severian, like mini-me Severian. No, I'm not making this up. It's like literally, I am big Severian, you shall be little Severian. It's like mini-me. So he's like, I got a little mini-me. And, and then he travels, and like I said, this is set in a medieval time frame. Like, it's, it's very post-apocalyptic, much like the Sword of Shannara, and the Shannara series was set in a, a post-apocalyptic earth this is actually set in earth too and they actually spell it u-r-t-h earth and um but it is our own earth like tens of thousands of years in the future when sort of technology has sort of been destroyed or forgotten or whatever and now they're living in a very medieval society but once in a while the technology just shows up out of nowhere like they they like Suddenly, Severian is like offered a ride in this, what he thinks is like an air canoe. Like it's an airboat. It's like floating on air, but it looks like a, a boat. But what it, what's described is like, and it's got twinkling lights and it's made of metal. And, it, and, it, and then they, they drive it away and it's floating on air and it's kind of like just hovering like a Luke Skywalker's land speeder. So suddenly we're in this medieval world, and I've told you this in these other reviews. You're in this medieval world and just laser blasters will show up randomly. Um, pistols will show up randomly. Um, starships from outer space will just sort of be hovering over the characters randomly. And now we've got this, what Severian calls the floating boat, which is, oh, the cat just opened the door. With a floating boat, um, which is essentially Luke Skywalker's land speeder. And so this, that's how bananas this series is. And you know, and then and then they come across these areas, and and the people are saying, okay, these, this this was this part of the landscape was destroyed a long time ago by an energy weapon, um, and so then we've got these, and then they start to see some of the energy, and then Severian kind of looks at some of the energy devices and weapons that were left left laying around from the uh, post apocalyptic Earth, you know. And, in, and, he just, and you try, and he, as he's describing them in his sort of medieval, he doesn't know how to describe them. Like the land speeder is a floating boat, he called it. But from the description, you clearly can tell it's like a Luke Skywalker land speeder. Well, these um, energy devices that he sees that he tries to describe them to the reader in his own language. But sometimes you're like, I don't know quite what he's describing. Until they start using it, I'm not really going to know what it is or if it's even from you know, the past or, or, or whatever, but this, this whole, oh, and then there's floating islands, which the floating islands started showing him. And then he's in a landscape where the islands are floating and I'm thinking, okay, now what is that? What's going on there? And, but it's never really described to the point where you actually know what it is and you've just got to keep reading and reading and reading and sort of figure it out. I still don't know what the floating islands really are. If they're some sort of man-made creation like some sort of man-made space city or something like that i don't know but we might find out because the way this series is going i think our main man severian the torturer that's been cast out of the torturer's guild 
and he's got his healing stone that can heal people like Jesus, I really do think that this is going in the direction of a sort of savior of the world type thing, like the second coming of Jesus type thing, where he's going to be somehow the um, second, because they always talk about the new son, the return of the new son. You know, we, this is called the book of the of the new son. I'm assuming he he, he might be the new son. Although it might, they might actually be talking about the sun, like a star, an actual star. That's why I don't, I mean, I don't know. I don't know. But the thing is, is that's why I love these books so much is because it's like putting together a very freaky acid trip, fever dream, clockwork, fun house puzzle. That's, that's how I can describe it. I give book number three, the sword of the lictor, lictor. I don't know how you pronounce that. Another 10 out of 10.